Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now, here is Pastor Dennis Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Ready to get back into our Father's Word here at the chapel, this fantastic book of 1 Samuel. We're going to pick it up today, chapter 9, verse 4. We invite you to get your Bible and join us if you care to. In chapter 8, uh, we saw that the people of Israel requested a man king. We want a man king to rule over us like the Gentiles of the nations that are our neighbors. And God said to Samuel, he said, you know, they haven't rejected thee, they have rejected me, the Lord speaking. And uh, God granted their wish, their, yeah, we're going to give you your man king, but uh, I'm going to have Samuel tell you what your man king will do to you. And Samuel laid it out. He said, the, the man king is going to take your sons and daughters and put them to his work. Uh, he's going to take a tenth part of your crops, your grapes from your vineyards, your olives from your olive yards. He's going to take the choicest of your vineyards and fields and give them to his servants. Uh, he's going to put your sons in his military to fight his wars. And uh, laid it out there and, uh, uh, and God said, you know, when you cry out to me, uh, I'm not going to hear you because I tried and tried to be your king and that's what God wanted all along was for him to be the king of Israel but the people weren't happy with that. They had to have a man king to rule over them. In chapter 9 as we began in our last lecture uh, just got started in it we see that uh, God has chosen a young lad by the name of Saul of the tribe of Benjamin and he's an ass keeper if you will, that can't find his donkeys. Uh, Kish, his father, by the way, I meant to tell you that in verse 1, uh, it says Kish, the son of Abiel in Numbers, uh, excuse me, in uh, uh, First Chronicles, Kish is the son of Ner. So, and the Bible critics go nuts and say, oh, the Word of God contradicts itself. Well, they show their ignorance because uh, there is no word uh, for the, the relationship of grandfather in the Hebrew. So uh, Abiel was an ancestor of Kish. He wasn't his direct father. His direct father was Ner. So uh, Ner sent, uh, I should say Kish sent Saul uh, out to look for the donkeys. That's where we picked it up. He sent one of his servants along with Saul and they're searching high and low for their donkeys. Uh, God has a purpose in it. Let's ask that word of wisdom in Yeshua Jesus' precious name. Father, we ask you to open eyes, open ears this day. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 4, and it reads, And he, this being Saul, passed through Mount Ephraim and passed through the land of Shalashah, uh, but they found them not then they passed through the land of Shalem, and there they were not. And he passed through the land of the Benjamites, but they found them not. They were looking everywhere for these donkeys. And uh, God is hiding the donkeys from Saul and his servant. You see, it's God's purpose to bring Saul and Samuel together, and that's what's happening here. Verse 5, And when they were come to the land of Zuf, uh, Saul said to his servant that was with him, Come, let us return, let's, let's go home, lest my father leave caring for the asses and take thought for us. He's, he's going to get worried about how long we've been gone to the point that he even forgets about the donkeys but becomes concerned about our welfare. When we get to verse 20 of this same chapter, we'll learn that they had been gone for three days at this point. Verse 6, And he, this is the servant of Saul that was with him, 
said unto him, Behold now, there is in this city a man of God, Samuel, a man of God indeed. And he is an honorable man. All that he saith cometh surely to pass. Now let us go thither, uh, peradventure he can show us our way that we should go. And Samuel is not only going to show them the way to go to find their donkeys, Samuel is going to show Saul the way that he is going to become king over the 12 tribes of Israel. And you can learn from this too in your life today. You know, when you've done, when you've got trouble in your life, and you've done all you can about it, go to the Lord, ask Him for help. And that's what the servant is suggesting. Let's, let's turn to the man of God, peradventure, He can help us find our donkeys. Uh, God can help you solve problems in your life if you'll allow Him. Verse 7, Then said Saul to his servant, But behold, if we go, what shall we bring the man, the man of God? For the bread is spent in our vessels. We've already eaten uh, all of our bread. We're out of victuals. And there is not a present to bring to the man of God. What have we? Question. And it was common practice at this time, particularly when you were asking favor, a favor of someone, that you brought a gift uh, to, to when you went into their presence. Verse 8. And the servant answered, Saul again and said, Behold, I have here at hand the fourth part of a shekel of silver. That will I give to the man of God to tell us our way. I've got a quarter of a shekel of silver I'll give to the man of God, and then he'll tell us where we can find our donkeys. Verse 9. Before time in Israel, notice this has got parentheses around this verse, before time in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, thus he spake, Come and let us go to the seer. For he that is now called a prophet was before time called a seer. In the earlier times, a prophet was called a seer. Uh, and I don't know about you, but the first time I heard that phrase, I, I had all kinds of visions about uh, well, are we talking about someone who's sitting at a crystal ball that supposedly uh, can see the future? Or, or a diviner who observes the clouds and tries to predict the future based on the movement of the clouds? Uh, and no, that's not what we're talking about. Seer, don't let that throw you, is just another name for a prophet. Uh, and it was used more so in the earlier years, according to this verse. Verse 10, Then said Saul to his servant, Well said, That's a good idea, good plan. Come, let us go. So they went into the city where the man of God was, seeking the help of God with their problem. Their problem was they couldn't find their donkeys. Verse 11, And as they went up the hill to the city, they found young maidens going out to draw water. And said unto them, Is the seer here? Now, uh, it's not written exactly how old Saul was at this point in time. Uh, I'm going to guess this was occurring around the year 1000 BC. Uh, Saul is probably in his early 30s at this point in time. And we saw in verse uh, 2 that. Of all the children of Israel, there wasn't a goodlier person than he from his shoulders and upward. He was higher than any of the people. He was tall and handsome. And being 30 young, early 30s, he's probably, uh, these young maidens have caught Saul's eye, being my point. Verse 12, And they answered them and said, He is, behold, he is before you, Make haste now, for he came today to the city. For there is a sacrifice or a feast of the people today in the high place. And the high place would be a place of worship of the Lord. Uh, at this point in time, keep in mind the tabernacle was totally uh, in disarray. 
So the people were worshiping where they could worship. So don't think anything badly of this high place. At the time that there was an established tabernacle, the children of Israel were to sacrifice at the altar at the tabernacle only. Now, this doesn't say what city uh, they're in. I, I do not believe it is Ramah, the home of Samuel. But keep in mind, too, Samuel was a judge of Israel, and he was continually in travel. He went yearly in that uh, circuit, a uh, circle that we discussed in our last lecture. Verse 13, As soon as ye be come unto the city, ye shall straightway find him, before he go up to the high place to eat. For the people will not eat until he come, because he doth bless the sacrifice, and afterwards they eat that be bidden, those who are invited. Now therefore get you up uh, for about this time, in the Hebrew it's for about today you shall find him. And in other words, Samuel would offer a prayer of thanksgiving, no doubt, uh, as the uh, religious leader of the nation at this time. And remember, he's not the high priest. He's simply a judge of Israel, but he's also a mighty prophet of the Lord, a man of God indeed. Verse 14, And they went up into the city, and when they were coming to the city, behold, Samuel came out against them for to go up to the high place. He was on his way uh, to bless the sacrificial meal that they would have. Verse 15, Now the Lord had told Samuel in his ear a day before Saul came, saying, now, don't overlook that verse, uh, God foretold Samuel that of Saul's approach and that it was Saul who would be the first man king of Israel. Verse 16, Tomorrow, about this time, I will send thee a man, this is God speaking to Samuel the day before, thee a man out of the land of Benjamin, and thou shalt anoint him to be captain. This word is a leader or king, it can be translated. Over my people Israel, that he may save my people out of the hand of the Philistines. For I have looked upon my people, because their cry is come unto me. Now that in the ancient Chaldean Syriac, this upon my people is translated, uh, I've looked upon the oppression of my people. And it's been several decades that uh, the Philistines have had their foot on the throat of Israel. And God is sending a deliverer. Uh, Samuel number one and then also now Saul will be delivering the people of Israel from the hand of the Philistines. Did Saul volunteer? No, Saul didn't volunteer. Um, no free will here. God sent him to deliver Israel. We have here a type for Jesus Christ. Verse 17. And when Samuel saw Saul, the Lord said unto him, Behold, the man whom I spake to thee of, this same shall reign over my people. And again, God wanted to be their king, uh, but the Israel wanted a man king that they could see as uh, face to face as the Gentiles had. God giving them what they want. What we've got here is a, an ass keeper who couldn't find his donkeys. And we can take something from that as well. Uh, we're going to see Saul being very humble over the next several verses. But, and there's nothing wrong with being humble. But when God selects you to, to accomplish something for him, his work, don't allow your humility to grow into doubt. Don't, don't, don't be a doubting Thomas, being my point. Verse 18, Then Saul drew near to Samuel in the gate, and said, Tell me, I pray thee, where the seer's house is. Where, where is Samuel's house? Now, 
again, this doesn't necessarily mean that they were at Ramah, which was the home of, of Samuel. Uh, uh, the seer's house is, in, in the Hebrew tongue could be just where is he located right now. And it's kind of funny, we got an ass keeper who can't find his donkeys, and at the moment he's having trouble locating the prophet's house as well. Verse 19, And Samuel answered Saul and said, I am the seer, I am the prophet, the man of God. Go up before me unto the high place, for ye shall eat with me today, and tomorrow I will let thee go, and will tell thee all that is in thine heart, everything that you want to know. Um, of course, the main thing in Saul's heart right now is where are my donkeys? There's going to be a lot more in his heart and his mind by the time Samuel gets through with him. Now, get a hold of this. Samuel is very highly thought of in the nation of Israel. Very few people would not consider it an honor to be in his presence. Here he is honoring Saul by saying, go up before me, you lead the way, which is a, 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 a esteem, an honoring Saul, if you will. Verse 20, and as for thine asses uh, that were lost three days ago, I would imagine Saul was turning to his servant about this time and saying, wow, how did he know that, the, that we've been looking for the donkeys for three days? He really is a prophet of God. Set not thy mind on them. Don't worry about the donkeys, for they are found. And on whom is all the desire of Israel? Is it not on thee and on all thy father's house? Samuel saying, Saul, you're it. He hadn't said you're the king yet, but uh, think what he's saying here. The desire of all Israel, is it not on you and your father's house? I'm sure Saul at this point is thinking, why is Samuel talking to me like this? We're going to see a very humble reaction. And Saul answered and said, Am not I a Benjamite of the smallest of the tribes? And indeed, in Judges chapter 20, due to what the men of Benjamin did to the, in Gibeah to the Levite and his concubine, uh, down to 600 men was all that were left of Benjamin at one point in time. And my family, the least of all the families of the tribe of Benjamin, Wherefore then speakest thou so to me? And Saul is humbly uh, doubting his credentials to be the king over Israel and to be honored such as Saul is honoring. But again, don't let your uh, humility turn to doubt. Verse 22, And Samuel took Saul and his servant and brought them into the parlor and made them sit in the chiefest place, the seats of highest honor, among them that were bidden, all, among all the people were invited, they got the most honorable place, which were about 30 persons. Again, Saul honor, excuse me, Samuel is honoring Saul. And Samuel said unto the cook, Bring the portion which I gave thee, of which I said unto thee, set it by thee. What, what portion is Samuel talking about? Pay attention, this is, this is very important. And the cook took up the shoulder and that which was upon it and set it before Saul. Now this shoulder is the heave, the right shoulder called the heave shoulder in Leviticus chapter 7 verse 32. Now what's significant about this is that that is the priest portion. And Samuel said, Behold that which is left, or, or that which is reserved. Set it before thee, and eat. For unto this time hath it been kept for thee, since I said, I have invited the people. So Saul did eat with Samuel that day. The shoulder, the heave shoulder, and the wave breast 
were the priest portion. Uh, Samuel has given that portion to Saul. Symbolically, we see the transfer from the theocracy where the priests were in charge to the monarchy, which is where the, a man is in charge. Verse 25, And when they were come down from the high place, the place of worship, into the city, Samuel communed with Saul upon the top of the house. Now, in this part of the world, uh, of course, at this time they didn't have air conditioning. But when the sun would go down, it was a popular place to go uh, onto the rooftop. This time houses had flat roofs, for those of you who didn't know. But it was the evening breeze was probably the coolest uh, place to be at that time. It was also a good place to have a confidential, uh, private conversation. Uh, Samuel's preparing Saul, uh, but yet he's not revealed to him at this point that he's the next king or the first king of Israel. Verse 26, And they arose early, and it came to pass about the spring of the day, the morning dawn, in other words, that Samuel called Saul to or from the top of the house, saying, Up, that I may send thee away. And Saul arose, and they went out, both of them, he and Samuel, abroad. Time for Israel to have a man king. And as they were going down to the end of the city, Samuel said to Saul, Bid the servant pass on before us. You tell your servant to go on ahead. Uh, this is not intended for your servant's ears, but for your ears only. And he passed on, the servant did. But stand thou still a while, that I may show thee the word of God. Now, he will prophesy the events to come uh, to Saul. And there are really insignificant things that Samuel is going to prophesy. But the thing is that the insignificant things came to pass, as all prophecies of God do. And Sam, Saul would realize as these insignificant events came to pass that everything that Samuel said was true, was the word of God. Chapter 10, verse 1. Then Samuel took a vial of oil, this would be anointing oil, olive oil, endowing uh, Saul with the Holy Spirit is the purpose of the olive oil, and poured it upon his head and kissed him and said, Is it not because the Lord hath anointed thee to be captain over his inheritance? Now, uh, I like the way Moffat translate the latter part of this verse as well as the Septuagint and the Vulgate, if you have access to that. And it states there, And thou shalt rule uh, among the people of Yahweh, and uh, they shall save them, he shall save them, thou shalt save them, I'll get it right, out of the hand of the enemies, and this shall be a sign unto thee that these things are going to come to pass. Another important thing to realize here is that uh, to this point in God's Word, uh, the only people who were anointed with the oil of our people, the olive oil, were the priests. So again, we see a shift <clears throat> from the theocracy to the monarchy. Verse 2, When thou art departed from me today, then thou shalt find two men by Rachel's sepulchre in the border of Benjamin at Zelzah. And they will say unto thee, The asses which thou wentest to seek are found. And lo, thy father have left the care of the asses. He's, he's stopped worrying about the business of the donkeys. And sorroweth for you, saying, What shall I do for my son? Your father is worried about where you are. Are you still in good health? Or did you run into trouble with the Philistines, possibly? Rachel's sepulcher, <clears throat> of course, uh, 
Uh, Rachel was the mother of the patriarch of the tribe of Benjamin. She named him uh, Benoni when he was born, son of my sorrow, because she died in child's birth in Rachel's sepulcher uh, on the border of uh, uh, Benjamin at, at Zelza. And uh, again, though uh, her husband Jacob renamed Benoni, son of my sorrow, Benjamin. Verse 3. Then shalt thou go on forward from thence, and thou shalt come to the plain of Tabor, and there shall meet thee three men going up to God to Bethel, house of God. Another uh, carrying three loaves, excuse me, one carrying three kids, and another carrying three loaves, these uh, bread, probably first fruit offerings, and another carrying a bottle of wine. Now, all of these symbolic of Jesus Christ. Uh, the kid of the lamb, of course, Jesus was the lamb of God. Uh, he was also the bread of life, uh, the bottle of wine symbolic of his blood, the communion uh, sacrament that we partake of when we take Holy Communion. But again, these are basically insignificant things, but when Saul sees them come to pass, uh, it's going to make a believer out of Saul. Verse 4, And they will salute thee. <clears throat> In Hebrew this means they will ask if it's peace. And give thee two loaves of bread, which thou shalt receive of their hands. Prophecy to be witnessed as these things come to pass. Saul be, be assured that everything Samuel said would also come to pass. Verse 5, After that thou shalt come to the hill of God. Now this is uh, Gibeah, which is Saul's home, where is a garrison of the Philistines. And it shall come to pass, when thou art come thither to the city, that thou shalt meet a company of prophets coming down from the high place with a psaltery and a tabret and a pipe and a harp before them, and they shall prophesy. Now, uh, these were all, of course, musical instruments. Now, the schools of the prophets were started by Samuel, and we learn a great deal about the schools of the prophets uh, from the prophets Elijah and Elisha. Uh, the schools of the prophets were really thriving and growing at the time of Elijah and Elisha. Now, the fact that they're back in Gibeah, the hill of God, Saul's home, uh, I couldn't help but think about Matthew chapter 13, verse 57, where Christ is teaching about prophets. And he said, a prophet is not without honor except in his own country. In other words, those people have known Saul all of his life, and for him to prophesy is going to be uh, quite an event. The prophets are going to prophesy, and then we learn in verse 6, And the Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee, on Saul, and thou shalt prophesy with them and shall be turned into another man. Uh, uh, this is all going to come to pass. I think this is a, a type for the election as well. When the Holy Spirit speaks through you when you're delivered up before the Antichrist, you will become another person. Verse 7, And let it be, or in the Hebrew, it shall come to pass, when these signs are coming to thee, all three of them, uh, that thou do as occasion serve thee, for God is with thee. And that's all the credentials that one needs to accomplish God's work, uh, that is, He is with you. And what Samuel's saying here is, at that point in time, the Holy Spirit is with you, don't follow what I say, Samuel, the prophet of God. You follow what the Holy Spirit tells you to do at that point in time. Verse 8, 
and thou shalt go down before me to Gilgal. And behold, I will come down unto thee to offer burnt offerings and to sacrifice sacrifices of peace offerings. Seven days shalt thou tarry, or you shall wait, till I come to thee and show thee what thou shalt do. And this is uh, the beginning of the organized rebellion against the Philistines. Now, Saul, when we get to chapter 13, will learn, and this was a command from God, not Samuel. Uh, this was all what God was saying through the prophet Samuel. When we get to chapter 13, we'll learn that Saul uh, failed to follow the instructions. He didn't wait for Samuel. He took it upon himself to offer the sacrifices because people were starting to leave. And he didn't want anybody leaving. He needed as many soldiers in his army to fight the Philistines as he could raise. Verse 9, and it was so that when he had turned his back or turned his shoulder to go from Samuel, God gave him another heart. This is another mind, a gift from God. And all those signs came to pass that day. God's prophecies always come to pass. And you remember when Samuel first became a judge, uh, God promised that there would not be a word of Samuel's that fell to the earth unfulfilled. Uh, if, if, if I give it to you, the Lord speaking, and you speak it, it's going to come to pass. And uh, Saul, no doubt, convinced that Samuel, uh, who he knew, uh, no doubt, uh, and honored him so highly with the feast and having him walk before, giving him the cheapest, the cheapest seat at the feast and also giving him the priest portion of the sacrificial meal, the heave shoulder. All of thing, these things no doubt have Saul feeling a bit astonished uh, that all of this has come to pass. Well, we'll see what happens next with our first man king of, of Israel, Saul, as we come back in our next lecture. Don't miss it. We've got a short message. We'll ask you to listen a moment. Won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It's getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13 verse 8, many will be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. No shipping and handling. Just call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also mail your request to Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. Welcome back. We're glad you could join back with us. Let's have the 800 number, please. 800-643-4645. That number good throughout Puerto Rico, the United States, and Canada. If you're studying via the internet somewhere else around the world and unable to use that 800 number, your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. If you have a biblical question that you'd like to pose to be on the air, feel free to call that number or you can mail in your question, but please don't ask questions about a specific individual denomination or organization by name. We try to teach God's Word in a positive manner. Throwing out negative about others serves no purpose. We simply won't do it. We'll let God's Word do the teaching, the correcting, and the healing, fully capable of all three. Got a prayer request, we can do away with the 800 number. You don't need a telephone. You don't need a mailing address. Your Heavenly Father is there for you 24-7. I encourage you to talk to Him. And you know, it's very easy to do. Uh, you don't have to go through any fancy rigmarole. You don't have to get down on your knees and close your eyes. 
You can talk to your father anytime, anywhere. While you're driving down the highway, you can talk to him. He's there for you. I encourage you to, to develop that relationship. And you know, your relationship with your heavenly father doesn't depend on him. He's the same yesterday, the same today, and he will be the same tomorrow. Uh, your relationship with your heavenly father depends on you. He's always there for you, so develop that relationship. We do have these prayer requests, Father. We come united as one in the name of your Son, Yeshua Messiah. We ask you to look upon these, Father. You know their needs, uh, drug addiction, alcoholism, Father. You know, uh, if it is your will, a special blessing on each of these. We also lift up our military troops around the world, Father. We ask you to watch over, guide, direct, touch, heal in Jesus' precious name. Amen and thank you, Father. All right, let's get to some questions. See what's on the mind of folks around the country. George from California. Did Job remember the first earth age? No, we, we all enter this flesh life uh, innocent. And that means that we have no memory of what happened in the first earth age. Uh, what does the Bible have to say about Rahab? Uh, mostly you'll find Rahab covered in Joshua uh, chapter 2 and chapter 6. Uh, in Joshua 2, 1, she's introduced as an harlot's house named Rahab. Uh, she lived in Jericho. Um, Joshua, with the Lord's help, destroyed Jericho, but Rahab and her father's family were saved because she helped Israel. Now, as to the matter of whether Rahab was an harlot or not, in Joshua chapter 2, verse 6, the, the spies that Joshua sent to Rahab, where did she hide them? Well, she hid the spies that Joshua sent in stalks of flax that were on the roof. Uh, if you don't know what it is, stripping flax is hard work. Uh, a, a harlot would not have uh, flax on her rooftop. She had the, uh, she was a good businesswoman, and people who wanted to damage her reputation uh, started the business about she was a harlot. Kay in Texas, does a person change after they have a significant loss in their family? Well, losing an immediate family member uh, or spouse is one of the ten most traumatic things that one can experience. Uh, I've often said that I don't know how people who don't have the truth about where the dead are can handle the loss of an immediate family member. It's hard enough if you do know the truth. Um, and if you don't know where your loved ones are, I suggest you order uh, one of the studies on our suggested uh, studies for new students, which you'll find on page three of every monthly newsletter, uh, but CD 30475 is called Where Are the Dead? And uh, a lot of people find comfort in that uh, study because it tells you where your loved one is. They're not out here in a hole in the crown. They're with the Heavenly Father. Rick from Arkansas, uh, I've been watching your program for about 20 years. Thank you and your staff for your teaching. You all do a very good job. Well, thank you. Uh, my question is about the parable of the fig tree. What is it and where do I find it in the Bible? The parable of the fig tree goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Uh, what did Adam and Eve make aprons out of to cover their private parts when they knew they were naked? Uh, fig leaves is what they use. Jeremiah chapter 24, we learn that there are good figs and there are naughty figs. Um, Jesus in the New Testament, Matthew chapter 24 verse 32 says, Now learn a parable of the fig tree. He didn't say, maybe you should get around to it. He says, learn it. That's another one, and the shoot was set out uh, in 1948 
which is when Israel became a nation uh, once again. Uh, I, again, I hate to sound like I'm selling CDs, but that's a critical study that you understand the parable of the fig tree. You'll find that also on that list on page three of every monthly newsletter, the parable of the fig tree. Jan from Illinois, my question is this, uh, in what ways did God speak to man in the Bible? Was it always audible or was it perhaps just to the heart or to the mind? Just wondering how his word was so accurately written down. Well, uh, God met with man in several ways. Uh, Moses was one of the few that God met with face to face. Uh, and uh, Solomon, uh, God appeared to him twice in a dream. Uh, uh, that's quite common in uh, many other instances in God's Word that God uh, communicated to people while they were sleeping. Uh, God wrote the directions for the tabernacle, the house of God, the, the Solomon's temple, on his servant David. And then David communicated those plans. David wanted to build that house for God, but God wouldn't let him. Why? because David was a man of war, a man of blood. Jackie in Tennessee, where in the Bible is it located that God will never place more on you than you can handle? 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. It states there that there is nothing going to happen to you that's not common to man. It's happened to someone other than yourself before. But God will never allow you to be tempted uh, beyond what you're able to handle. And uh, if you're given a lot to deal with, God knows you can handle it. Carl in New Jersey, where is America talked about in the Bible? Now, I believe Isaiah uh, chapter 18 verses 1 through 3 speaks of the USA. Uh, also in the book of Genesis, uh, 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 chapter 28, verses 13 through 20, uh, talks about Ephraim and Manasseh, uh, one being Great Britain, one being the United States of America. Uh, the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, uh, mentioned in James chapter 1, verse 1, is addressing the inhabitants of the United States who are descendants of Israel. <clears throat> Teresa in Louisiana, in Revelations, when the earth is restored and the water is gone, what happens to the water animals? Well, understand, Teresa, when that happens, there is no flesh. So, in essence, there will be no water animals any longer at that time. Um, flesh mammals, and such as whales and fish, uh, need water to survive. Spiritual beings need only the living water of Revelation uh, chapter 22, verses 1 and 2, which of course is Jesus Christ. Uh, Cleista from Georgia, my question is, do the two witnesses come before Satan or between Satan and Jesus Christ? Uh, pray for my family and for me. You are in our prayers. Revelation chapter 11, verse 3 we learn that the two witnesses prophesy 1,260 days. Now, in Revelation chapter 13, we learn that the uh, Antichrist, uh, the second beast of Revelation 13, has 42 months. Uh, the 1,260 days is 10 days longer than 42 months. So the two witnesses will be here before Antichrist appears. In Matthew 24, 22, uh, God states that the time has been shortened for the elect's sake. And I believe the times uh, for the two witnesses and the Antichrist, uh, how long they appear before the Antichrist, has been shortened proportionally as well. Pam in Michigan. Will you please clearly explain what Matthew 24:20 and Mark 13:18 means? 
and pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. Well, the subject uh, uh, there in, in Matthew 24 and Mark 13, uh, it states there in verse 15 of Matthew 24, when you see the abomination of desolation stand in the holy place where it ought not, or he ought not, as Moffat translates, flee Jerusalem. Now, the Sabbath, you had limited amount of travel on the Sabbath day. Uh, in winter, when do we harvest crops? We don't harvest crops in the winter time. So that means that you would be harvested out of season. So that's what it means to pray that your flight to the mountains, in other words, get out of Judea, be not in the winter or on the Sabbath. The Sabbath because you're limited as to how far you can travel, the winter uh, because you would be being harvested out of season. Lindsay from Texas. Um, I'm writing you in reference to a, I can't read your writing, I listen to, I'm a minister at my church. I always study and try to understand the Word of God. Uh, a few ago, if I understand that you said that Cain was the son of Satan, would you please give me the name and of the book and the chapter and verse? Well, okay, let's start with what really happened in the Garden of Eden. And uh, if you're a minister, Lindsay, you need to order uh, Pastor Arnold Murray's work 30146, which explains the creation, what happened, actually happened in the Garden of Eden. There wasn't any apple trees there. Um, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15 and 16. God is addressing the serpent and Eve for what they had done. And in verse 16, he said to Eve, I will greatly multiply thy conception. And do you know what causes conception? Well, I certainly hope you do. Uh, Cain was the first child born uh, of Eve. Abel then was born, but Abel, was they were twins, but they had different fathers and ask any medical doctor if that's possible, he'll tell you that it is. Now, you'll find Cain's genealogy completely separate from Adam's genealogy in the book of Genesis. Adam's genealogy you'll find in chapter 5 of Genesis. Cain is not there. You will find Cain's genealogy in Genesis chapter 4. Again, if you're a, a pastor, you need to understand. If you don't understand what happened in the beginning, there's no way you're going to understand what's going to happen in the end. Order uh, Genesis, the first six chapters, uh, the uh, CDs 30146. Kathy in Minnesota, why does God allow some people to get away with things? For instance, one person treating his mom wrong. Well. Uh, for the most part, we all have free will. God's elect do not have free will. Uh, those who do evil things don't get away with anything, as you are suggesting here. Uh, God keeps very good records. And what is, are people going to be judged upon at the great white throne judgment in Revelation uh, chapter 20, verse 11? Uh, verse 12 states, the books are opened and everyone will be judged according to their works. No one gets away with anything. <clears throat> There's a Psalm 37 that is an acrostic psalm. And uh, verses 7, 20, and 34, I believe they are, uh, have three lines in the manuscripts. All the others have four lines. And it points out there, that don't be troubled about those who seem to get ahead in the ways of the world. And then in verse 20, it says they're going to be just like the fat of a lamb on a spit. You ever seen a little piece of fat hit the fire on a grill? It goes up in smoke. 
And then in verse 34 states that uh, those who are righteous will be there to see uh, their destruction. I wish I could read your, Anna Dean, here it is in New York. It's a pretty name, Anna Dean in New York. Who wrote the book of Ecclesiastes? Yes, it says the son of David and it says he was the preacher. Where is more about the son of David? Uh, that uh, is the same man who wrote the book of Proverbs and the Song of Solomon. Of course, David's son Solomon, the, uh, probably one of the most wisest men. Why, why was he wise? Because God said, ask what you will of me when he appeared to him in the, the first dream. Ask what you will of me. And Solomon said, I ask for wisdom so I can rule your so great a people, Israel. And God granted his wish. You follow with the question, how do you say Kohalith? He was king over Israel in Jerusalem. Uh, can you elaborate? You explain things very well. God bless your entire staff, your network, and your family. Well, thank you, and God bless you as well. There is no Kohalith uh, that was a king of Judah or Israel, for that matter, by that name. I don't know where you're coming from with that. Uh, if you are hearing this response, Tell me where you found Kohalith in the Bible. Robert in Virginia. Um, if Satan was to guard the mercy seat, who or what was he protecting it from? Uh, thank you for your ministry. Your show has taught me and my wife a lot in a short period of time. We have been watching and we're, we're glad that you're learning. Please answer this question in the next newsletter. You're asking that we sit down and write out a note to you responding to your question and mail it in the next newsletter. We can't do that, number one, because it's illegal to put additional paper in the newsletter. And also, we don't offer written responses to questions. But uh, and what was uh, necessary to protect the mercy from? Oh, wicked and evil. Um, there has been wicked and evil in the world pretty much from the get-go. Ed in California, will we need to sleep in the millennial age? Well, there, there is no flesh <clears throat> in the millennial age. Uh, I don't know if the angels sleep, the angels eat. I know that from the book of Psalms when, because it, there we learn that uh, when Israel was coming out of Egypt and God gave them manna from heaven, that was angel's food, as it's called in the book of Psalms. Man, I sure, I, I will miss that part of being in the flesh if there is no sleep. You follow one other question, how does one humble oneself? Uh, and then you mention scripture, 1 Peter 5, 6. And uh, don't get on... Um, don't be egotistical is how you humble yourself. Uh, glorify God, not yourself. Uh, Jesus said on many occasions in the New Testament that if you humble yourself, God will exalt you. But if you exalt yourself, prepare to be abased, which means to be brought low or humbled. Dacey in Mississippi, I am nine years old. I have a whole family that knows God, but my mother, mother's sister, and my brother do not know God. My brother believes in zombies. I try to teach them sometimes, but they don't listen to me. Even my grandmother tries, still they don't listen. I try to tell my brother zombies are not real, but there are demons uh, what do I how what do I do to teach them? Well, you teach them the truth, uh, Daisy, and I'm sure you and your grandmother studied the Bible together. And the Bible tells us truth about demons and zombies. But if they don't want to listen, uh, you know, after you've tried once or twice, you've fulfilled your responsibility trying to help them. And there is such a thing in Matthew chapter 7, verse 6, where Jesus teaches us, don't cast 
your pearls before swine. In other words, some people are not going to understand the truth. Uh, some of them have been blinded by our Heavenly Father. But when you continue to share truth with them, that's the precious seed or the pearls, if you will, of Matthew chapter 7, uh, you're casting your pearls, God's truth, before swine. You're wasting precious seed, in other words. Robert in California, is it this year that the devil comes in May through September? Well, you've misunderstood something you've seen on the program. Revelation chapter 9 does tell us that the season of the locust is when the Antichrist returns. But that doesn't mean exactly what the, the season of the locust is May through September. But what we're looking at there is simply the period of time five months. Nowhere in God's Word does it say Antichrist will be here May through September. Uh, no one knows what year uh, it will happen, only our Heavenly Father. Glenn in New York, when people go to heaven, will they be clothed? Well, some will, some won't. Uh, Revelation chapter 14, verse 13, we learn that when we die, all we can take with us is our works, whether good, bad, or ugly. Revelation 19 uh, verse 8 tells us that in heaven our uh, linen, the robes, will be made of the righteous acts of the saints. So some will be walking around naked as a jaybird. Some will have a nice long robe. Out of time, I love you all a great deal. Why? Because you enjoy studying God's Word in depth. Uh, and you know what? It makes God's day when he looks down and he sees you with the letter he wrote to you, open seeking knowledge of him. Uh, blessings, blessings always follow. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, help us keep coming to you and to reach out to others who are lost in this world of darkness. Most important this, though, you stay in his word every day. And your Father's day is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? because Jesus is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast CD, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a CD catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel. P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at the same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.